Welcome to everyone. I'm Paul Gardulo, a curator here at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I'm also the project director for the current exhibition, Make Good the Promises, Reconstruction and Its Legacies, and co-editor co of its companion volume, Make Good the Promises, Reclaiming Reconstruction and Its Legacies. And I am so thrilled to be the moderator for this discussion around the history and legacies of Watch Night and Freedom the Eve in, in our memory. The power, the resilience, and the peril of not remembering this history. And I'm here with a wonderful panel of guests, some home folks, some from outside, but all tonight we're in community together. Kendra Flanagan, is the director of the teaching and learning unit in the education department at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. She oversees the development of programming and resources to assist educators in incorporating African American history in classrooms. She was the co developer and co convener of NMHC's phenomenal race portal that grew from the groundbreaking talking about race teacher training series and most recently she has served with me and our fabulous team on Make Good the Promises on the exhibition content team. Hollis Gentry, also with us at the museum, is a genealogy specialist where she coordinates the genealogical research services for Smithsonian Libraries and Archives branch at NMAHC. Here she provides genealogical and historical reference services. She develops and implements instruction programs and presentations and she serves as a genealogical consultant on the museum's special projects including importantly the museum's freedman's bureau project digital records transcription project which are featured heavily in make of the promises dr kate maser is a professor of history at northwestern university Finalist for the Lincoln Prize, she is the author of An Example for All the Land, Emancipation and the Struggle Over Equality in Washington, D.C. Her newest book, Until Justice Be Done, America's First Civil Rights Movement from the Revolution to Reconstruction, was just named one of the New York Times Critics' Best Book of the Year. She has long been dedicated to making her scholarship on race, rights, and freedom work good outside of academic circles as well. She served as a scholarly advisor for our own exhibition, Make Good the Promises, and advised and co-authored a study on reconstruction for the National Park Service to help them better interpret this vital American story for all people and national park sites. And last but not least, Melisande Short Cologne a descendant of the Mahoney and Queen families, enslaved and then sold by the Society of Jesus in 1838 to ensure Georgetown University's solvency. Works as a community engagement associate in Georgetown's Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics, otherwise known as the Lab. They recently produced her one-person play entitled Here I Am that explores her loving and complicated relationship with the institution that enslaved her ancestors and uses that as a lens into matters of racial justice and reckoning in America. She began her relationship with Georgetown University in 2017, when at age 63, she moved from her native Louisiana, where she retired as a chef and entered the College of Arts and Sciences as a freshman. Melly's convocation robe and head wrap are on display in the exhibition, Make Good Promises. And so with that, I would really like us to begin to talk about, for many of us who are watching this program, they've participated in Freedom Eve activities for years and perhaps decades. Maybe they did so as children, but for many others in our audience, they don't have a deep understanding of the history or meaning of Freedom's Eve. And Kate, I'd love to begin with you and to give us to give us a little historical context. What is Freedom's Eve? What is Watch Night? Are they the same thing? 
Did they derive from one another? When did they begin and why were they founded? Thank you for those for the question. And it's so lovely to be here with you all. Um, so I want to get us started just by talking a little bit about the history of Freedom's Eve um, gatherings and how they're connected to Watch Night. It turns out that many religious traditions, especially many different Protestant religious traditions, had what were called watch night services or watch night meetings going way, way back in time. And these were typically um, religious services that would be held late at night going into midnight and, and kind of um, celebrating the turn of a new day. And then many of these watch night uh, religious services were held on New Year's Eve. So there was a tradition in Protestant religions in particular going very far back in, in celebrating the coming of the new year with a watch night service. Now, one of the ways that this tradition begins to merge with the tradition of celebrating freedom is actually with the beginning of British emancipation. Um, when the British Empire decided to end slavery uh, through a process of gradual emancipation, that policy went into effect on August 1st, 1834. And we have uh, records and histories of how across the British Caribbean on the night of July 31st, 1834, going into August 1st, watch night services were held in which um, African-Americans who were about to become free or at least to embark on the process of gradual emancipation gathered in services to celebrate the coming of freedom. Um, and these watch night services were repeated on July 31st going into August 1st, um, many times in, in the Caribbean and also in North America to celebrate um, the coming of emancipation in the British Empire. So there were enough connections between people in the Caribbean and people in North America that before long um, in the 1830s, African-Americans in the North were celebrating Watch Night and August 1st um, in their churches in, again, July, July 31st going into August 1st. And so already, even before the Watch Night tradition and the Freedom's Eve traditions that we know are associated with the coming of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, this tradition was kind of getting um, going into practice was and black northerners would have been very familiar with watch nights celebrating the coming of freedom because of this British Empire connection. So what we know um, is that the first the big watch nights that celebrate freedom in the United States began on December 31st, 1862 in anticipation of the issuing of the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. Um, and there are records in newspapers, in retrospective accounts of the widespread nature of these celebrations. So um, as our listeners will know, the Lincoln announced plans for to issue the Emancipation Proclamation in September of 1862. So there was plenty of time to plan ahead um, in hope that he would follow through on, on the promise um, to issue the proclamation. So by the time we get to, to December 31st of 1862, uh, we have accounts of uh, in the northern states, churches planning to have a Freedom's Eve celebration, a watch night celebration, and then many very detailed accounts of these kinds of celebrations in Washington, D.C. in particular, um, where people gathered, particularly in what was known as the contraband camp, the place where people who had escaped from slavery had come and they had gathered in what we might call a refugee camp, a place where displaced people were gathered in Washington, D.C. There was a huge watch night service um, in, that, in that place. And there are many wonderful accounts of, of how it transpired. Kate, thanks. I mean, it's fascinating the, the depth of diaspora in history that exists far, far back in, in African-American history and culture and, and the ways in which the, not just the, the international qualities of it, but the cross-cultural communication and, and learning that's going on and melding and the way that then morphs into a more national story. And I guess I'd love to, you know, we were talking the other day with, as a group all together, and we had this incredible round robin where we, we suddenly turned from a discussion around history into our panelists talking about what they knew about watch night growing up participating in services and it inspired us to 
to want to recreate that a little bit here to talk for us to talk personally about um, how you learn about Watch Night growing up, how how you participated in services and Melisande coming from Louisiana, um, in some ways, the most Caribbean part of the United States. I wonder if you knew about that tradition, what you knew about um, Freedom's Eve growing up and how it was celebrated or, or memorialized in, in your family and community. Sure. Ah, thank you, Paul. Um, New Orleans, Louisiana is a very, very religious town, contrary to popular opinion. And uh, before there were um, bands and bars, there were churches everywhere, all kinds of churches, Catholic churches, Baptist churches, Episcopal churches, spiritual churches, um, and I was born into segregated New Orleans um, at a very particular time in history. My grandmother was the second generation born free. I'm the fourth. Um, and in her family, because there were connections to uh, Washington, D.C., and, and Maryland, and family here. Um, and New Orleans is that very Caribbean city. Um, watch night was very, very important. Um, we always went to church. I grew up in the Congregational Church. Um, and we always went to church. And from the time I was a little girl, um, New Year's Eve was at one of two churches, Central or Beecher. And we would go to the watch night services. We would sit, there wasn't a whole lot of talking. There was a whole lot of music. There was some testimony. It was quiet and it was praying and I would go to sleep. Um, and somebody would carry me home and I would wake up the next morning and the, um, the New Year's Day celebration would begin. But since we talked the other day, I've really been thinking a lot about this end of year tradition. When I worked in the Caribbean, I, in St. Croix, old year was a very, very big night throughout the Caribbean. When I lived in Ghana, um, Christmas and New Year's Eve were also equally large celebrations. And it speaks to colonialism in, in the world sense, in, in the diaspora, but specifically here in America, um, Watch Night spoke to uh, New Year's Eve, 1862. And that was people going to their gatherings and watching and waiting for the new day. And the new day was Freedom Day. So to watch through the night carefully as a community together, keeping one another safe through the night is one of the primary things that's in our DNA here um, as multi-generational African-Americans and descendants of people who were enslaved in this place during this time. Um, the, the legacy of enslavement is tragic. The legacy of freedom is still with us. So when I had my kids, I was that mom who never went out. You have to wake me up at midnight 
to wish me happy year. And other people were going to parties and doing this, that, and the other. Whatever you're doing at midnight is what you're going to be doing for the rest of the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I like to find myself in bed, <laughs> nice, clean sheets, fully, <laughs> and the New Year's. And my kids would all come pile on me and their dad, and they would wake me up, and I'm like, hey, Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And Kendra, I heard uh, you're a mom. I, I, I felt some resonance there for you. What was it like in your family uh, growing up? Did you have a historical sense? Was there historical consciousness, as we say, about Freedom's Eve? How did how did it how did it work in in your family? So for Freedom's Eve, um, and, and that's a new term for me, Freedom's Eve, we typically called watch night service, we would go to watch night service. And I went with my grandmother. Uh, she was the, the initiator of we're headed to church and all of the kids, all of the young children, and usually some other accompanying aunts, uncles uh, would all go to church. And I we attended when I was younger, I attended the same church that my dad grew up in, which is uh, Turner Memorial African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, that was based in D.C. at the time. And our church was really it took a lot of pride in being named for Henry McNeil Turner, who uh, many people might recognize the name as a luminary in the history of the AME church and um, was also a well-known Reconstruction era politician. But the historical connections for Watch Night weren't something that were a part of that experience. Um, so I, t I attended dutifully as all the young kids in the family did until they were old enough to opt out and uh, stay home and e attend those parties <laughs> uh, or uh, join with the family in the games and whatever sparkling beverages were being served. Uh, but I remember sitting in church and wondering, what's happening? What are we doing? What are we doing here? This is taking a long time. What are we waiting on? And I started thinking as we've been, you know, getting ready for this program, I was like, what, what did I think we were waiting on? Um, I think part of it, I wasn't sure maybe we were waiting for the second coming to happen or we were going to see if it was going to happen and church was the place to be if that was happening. Um, I also remember thinking, you know, that being there in church, again, kind of back to what Melly was saying is like how you started where you were at midnight was how you were going to keep going for the rest of the year. And so that was part of the uh, impetus to be there at church. Um, and then as I became older and started studying history, I was I would read descriptions of and see images of watch night services. And it was like, oh, that's what we've been doing this whole time. And I mean, really, for me, it was this connection across time and and realizing looking back and, and having that warm feeling that what I had been a part of, that even though I might have complained a little bit when I was a part of it, that um, I was really a part of this long serving tradition. And um, that actually made the experience feel so much more precious to me as I was looking back and had had the opportunity to experience that with my family and especially with my grandmother um, who grew up in Georgia. And so that was really, uh, uh, it's been, it's has become a very precious memory for me. And like I said, I attended the same church that my father grew up in. And so I asked him about his experience because I was really curious. And I said, well, maybe it was something that they just kind of didn't say out loud to us because we were, you know, that much further removed from the experience. But I asked him and he said that, yeah, no, I went. He said, I don't remember them saying anything in church about what watch night was for, but he said his experience, uh, unfolded very similarly to mine in that as he became older and started reading about history that he realized this is what we're doing. This is what we're honoring. This is what we are continuing a tradition to do. And he brought up something to me, reminded me of something that Melly just uh, mentioned, and that's the element of safety. Um, and he reminded me that, you know, in that even in that in that moment of 1862, it was an element of safety to be gathered together for freedoms.
safety for watch night and that it continues to be an element of safety as you were often admonished that like there's nothing going on out there after 11 o'clock at night that you all need to be involved in so <laughs> that we were safe for being in church <laughs> And, you know, I think that's so, I, I think that is so important because it, te it, it, it implies that the lessons to be learned are multiple. Oftentimes they're imbued with the history, even if the history is not unspoken, you know, and I don't want to get too philosophical about this, but I think that's, <laughs> but I think that is, those traditions carry on. And, and I, and I wonder what we, if, if it would have changed for you to have the tradition more explicitly known? I mean, it sounds like this, I'm, I'm very interested in how you learned as an adult and it seemed to, it seemed to make your childhood experiences resonate deeper. And I wanna come back to you on that maybe a little later to talk about what that means for you as an educator now and how people learn and what they should learn and what they should just, what they should learn didactically and what they should just learn by living. <laughs> but before we do that, I really want to hear from Hollis because I, I'm sure Hollis has has an experience that could, that is resonant here for us all. Hollis, what's your what's your family history with this with this history? I think the earliest memories I have are um, the preparation for it in my family where we had to clean up. And I also thought about my both my mom and dad were great cooks. And so there was always this preparation for the meal on January 1st. So um, the that practice of having a clean home to start out the new year. So we had to make up our beds. We had to have everything clean. Uh, typically, we would possibly have family members over. Uh, or if we were going to church to the watch night service, then there would be preparations to get that done before we went to church. I grew up in an Episcopal church, St. Philip's uh, Episcopal Church in Annapolis, and there were services. But as I got older, we uh, traveled quite a bit around the holidays. And so I spent uh, the new year in my grandmother's home in Norfolk, Virginia. I'm a seventh generation uh, Norfolkian. And as I began to trace my ancestry, I learned that my ancestors took part of a parade on January 1st, and there was a service they attended on Freedom's Eve. My great great uncle Daniel Langley was a marshal in that parade. He was also a veteran of the U.S. Colored Troops. And so my fa I, I learned through genealogy that my family had been uh, observing this uh, tradition for many generations, but it wasn't shared with us until actually, um, well, actually the the connection wasn't discovered until I started tracing my ancestry. I knew that the family attended these services. And so uh, I, during the course of interviewing ancestors or interviewing relatives rather, I called my, my aunt Jackie who knows all stories about the family. And I asked her what she did on that night. And she said for the children, they would have a service where notch, uh, watch night was, um, presented to them as a night when they were watching over the baby Jesus. And so they were having, they had a nativity and the kids were uh, given uh, apples and oranges and candy. So for them, it was connected to the birth of Christ. Uh, through research, I understand it was connected to the uh, emancipation, the anticipation of emancipation. Norfolk was one of those unique cities that was exempted from the uh, the emancipation in the sense that it was not in the Confederate territory. But, you know, the thing that I think about most is that they celebrated anyway. I guess they anticipated that, you know, freedom was coming to a, a large portion of the population, even though that uh, proclamation did not apply to them, they were going to celebrate anyway. So as I continue to look at that celebration, and I also look for other um, information regarding it, I also look at how December was the month in which the enslaved population typically negotiated for the coming year. So December was this period where uh, enslaved people were 
making contracts, well, uh, not legal contracts, but they were looking for work for the next year and they were settling up for the work that had been uh, done in that previous year. And so this period was also, especially in Norfolk, it was a port city. Um, it was a city, it was an urban environment. So there were a lot more people who were experiencing different levels of freedom. There were some people who were free, some who were working towards their freedom, and those who were waiting for that moment to happen. So, you know, that moment of emancipation, that moment of freedom differed for uh, different segments of the population. And so I reflect on that as I am researching that experience. You know, when I find someone who was living at that time, I ask myself the question, were they free at the moment? You know, where were they at that moment and what was that experience for them? Yeah, that, that is so important, Hollis. And I think that, that I thank you for bringing that, that, um, that history, that wonderful history of Norfolk, because I think what it, what I think it also demonstrates to me is that this moment was about vigilance, yes, and it was about watching and waiting, but it was also about watching and waiting for a moment to seize freedom, mm -hmm. not just waiting for something to be given. And uh, I'm also struck from all of your responses, this, this sense of um, a cultural memory that, that, that has morphed and changed across space and time, right? As, as many do, but, but really this, a, a disconnection from the emancipatory sort of origins of of Watch Night in some ways, and but Kate, I wonder if that was always the case. I wonder if if we're talking about gener immediate generations following following the period of slavery through Reconstruction through the early decades of the 20th century whether there was a whether there was a stronger cultural connection and and whether it was one that families passed down have have you ever i know you connected to and and brought back to life a book uh called they knew lincoln right and and you were talking to us a little bit about what that tells us about how how this history was remembered in the early part of the 20th century Right. Well, when we first started talking about this event, um, I was it immediately reminded me of a chapter from this book. They knew Lincoln. Uh, it was the author of the book is John E. Washington, and the book was published in 1942. And John E. Washington was an African-American teacher in the D.C. public schools. He actually taught at Cardozo High School. Um, but he was also a historian and he was all his life very interested in the period of emancipation. He was born in 1880 and he was raised by his grandmother in Washington, D.C. And the thing that immediately came to mind uh, when thinking about Watch Night was this story that he tells about. So when he was a child, basically, he was somebody who was always really interested in the stories that older people told, you know, and some of us are interested in that kind of thing. And some of us aren't or come to appreciate it later in life. But for Washington, he grew up uh, knowing his grandmother's friends and his grandmother's friends, his grandmother ran a boarding house in DC. And her friends were people of her generation, many of whom had been born enslaved and had escaped from slavery uh, during the time of slavery, or they had um, become free during the Civil War. And she would have her friends over and little John Washington, when he was a boy, would listen to these older people tell stories, and he really remembered them. And this is part of what he wrote about in his book, They Knew Lincoln. And one of the stories he remembered was that his, first of all, his grandmother would have watch night meetings at her house. So as his recollection was that they would just, her friends would come over on New Year's Eve and they would tell stories and wait um, to ring in the new year together. And on one of those occasions, his a friend of his grandmother's, who he refers to as Aunt Phoebe Bias, um, but B I A S, Aunt Phoebe Bias, she told the story of being at the watch night services in Washington, D.C. on the eve of emancipation itself from going into 1863. And so John Washington, again, born in 1880, remembered her telling the story and he transcribed what he remembered of that in his book. And it's a wonderful story. I thought I would just read like a tiny bit of it. Um, so among, okay. 
So um, he's he's talking about what Phoebe Bias had said about what it was like to be at this meeting. Um, and and this is similar to other accounts of watch night services at this time period that there would be a minister and people kind of speaking and doing services. But then as as midnight drew near, people would become quiet and wait and wait for the for the new year, wait for 12 midnight to come. And um, so he wrote that she said, at first, all was still as death. Then as the hands on the old church clock moved toward 12, you could hear some brother or sister cry, moan, or pray out loud for God to keep on guiding them when the hour of freedom came, just as he had led them out of bondage. And also they cried in loud voices for God to guide, support, and strengthen the hand of the man who had brought them their freedom. When the city bells rang in the new year, the year of their freedom, men and women jumped to their feet, yelled for joy, hugged and kissed each other and cried for joy. Many could not stand the excitement and fell into trances all over the house while the crowd yelled, praise God and kept yelling freed at last. I'm so glad I'm freed at last. Um, they had prayed for freedom that night it came. And he remembered her telling the story and he remembered it well enough to put it down in his own book and so I think one of the things besides just the kind of remarkableness of having that oral tradition passed down and written down then by John Washington is that he heard that story in his own home, right? That it was being transferred from one generation to another while he was sitting in his, you know, as a child in his grandmother's home. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, there's a continuity from what we see here to the kinds of stories people have shared already about, you know, being a child, going to these kind of services, maybe not fully understanding them in the way that you would later, but kind of getting a sense from family and from traditions of what what uh, the history is that 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 lies beneath these these kinds of celebrations. Yeah, uh, that's that's an incredibly moving story, um, and I and I think about how many of those stories are um, seemingly lost, ready to be found. Um, even now, and I, and I think about the ways in which you all have talked about the power of coming to a deeper knowledge of, of this history um, and its connection to sort of seizing freedom, to sort of a moment of emancipation with cautious vigilance around it. Um, that I that I, I really want to, as a museum, help us sort of spread that story, spread that history so that we can help others, all people who 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 have ears to hear and want to sort of build connections back to the past as a wellspring for their present lives um, to begin to reclaim and remember this history. Um, so it doesn't get lost and uh, and traditions around freedom making and emancipation and you know you all work in it, it professionally in it, around these very questions and so you know what i'm really hoping to hear from you all from the perspective of genealogy or from the perspective of history or from the perspective of art or perhaps activism from the perspective of education you know what is the power in your in your work that can help people reclaim the, this history that you've come to know uh, more deeply um, through through doing deep research or work in the field. Hollis, maybe we can begin with you. And I feel like this is a moment where we can where maybe we can speak to each other a little bit about this and. Well, you know, the way that I regard genealogy, it's a process through which one can make a personal connection to history. We look at ourselves and we connect to the past through our ancestry, the actual process of finding genealogical evidence of, of lives lived, the formal records that one would have, and then the oral traditions, the history that's passed down. Uh, so we're working with recorded history and oral history. And 
one of the things that I focus on primarily in making this connection to the past is documenting those stages of each ancestor. You know, you start with yourself. What kind of life are you living? And uh, what kind of documents show proof of that existence? Uh, what are your likes, dislikes, your preferences, so on and so forth? And you take that approach with every generation to connect to the past. And in the process of that, in the gathering of this information, this genealogical information and evidence, you are helping to preserve that history and then connecting it to an earlier history and going back. Uh, in terms of this um, tradition, I had no idea when I started out with uh, asking questions about my ancestry that I would find a connection to the watch night service, the watch night event. And then as I studied slavery and set out to document or identify individuals who were enslaved, I was always trying to connect them to the chronology of enslavement and certain uh, dates and certain experiences. So for me, uh, genealogy helps you to take the average individual or a family or a community and document that experience to make that connection, to make that, um, to um, illustrate and illuminate what that experience was. And I hope that is, you know, that, that speaks to, um, what the process is for us. Um, for me, because I not only trace my own ancestry, but I assist other individuals in tracing their ancestry, I try to stress the importance of looking at contemporary events and trying to connect them to the past to see where we find some of these unknown or previously unknown connections, for example, in terms of voting. Um, I had a grandmother who stressed the importance of voting. She worked the polls, but it wasn't until I was able to research uh, the period uh, during Reconstruction when African Americans gained the ability to vote that it had this uh, greater importance uh, or significance for me. I work as a content specialist with the Freedmen's Bureau Records uh, Transcription Project. I found in those records uh, evidence where my third great grandfather, Africa Langley, voted for the first time. So, you know, there are these moments where I've had these chill blains that, you know, that are just, that that take me back in history and connect me to the, the present and help me to understand that I have inherited quite a bit from my ancestors, partly unknowingly and now knowingly, I have the ability to search through genealogical evidence through records to find those connections. And with that ability, I can now serve as uh, someone who is preserving that history and sharing it and disseminating it with others and showing other people how to do the same. Thank you, Hollis. Um, you know, Kate, I, I think about your your work in history and how much resonance Hollis's answer must have with some of the work you do. And, and I'm thinking in particular about how you're looking, you know, you expanded your sort of chronology at looking at moments of finding freedom for African Americans, you know, into a much broader palette. And I wonder if, you know, what that, where that journey is taking you in terms of helping us understand, you know, both remembering an event by Freedom's Eve, like Freedom's Eve, watch night, but also putting it in that broader context of, of, you know, freedom seeking writ large as a, as a practice across time and space by many black communities. It took me a second to unmute myself. But, um, one thing that I realized as I was working on the my book that came out recently, which really goes, as you said, it goes back in time. Um, this is not news to a lot of people, but just fathoming that slavery existed and was a legal institution all in all of British North America at the time that the United States was founded. And so 
when we think about practices of making freedom and think about what does it mean to be free? How do people, how have people of African descent kind of grabbed onto freedom, uh, which to me often has to do with building communities, um, creating families, creating institutions that support and nurture communities, um, that that was a project that, you know, did not only happen in the Southern states after the Civil War, it happened um, in the Northern states after slavery was abolished. It happened as people migrated from the Southern states into the Northern states long before the Civil War, right? People, whether they were um, enslaved and trying to kind of escape from slavery, some people became free in the Southern states and remained there and built communities there um, in interaction with enslaved communities. So, you know, as Hollis has talked about being descended from people who had been both free and enslaved before the Civil War. Um, so we have that phenomenon. And then those Northern Black communities, you know, and thinking back again to the idea that when emancipation in the British Empire began in the 1830s, they knew all about that, right? Enslaved people, many enslaved people in the South would have known that that was happening too, right? People were following the news, news was circulating. I mean, of course, the Haitian Revolution, which even predates that, was a source of great fear among many white Americans and a source of great inspiration and hope for many black Americans to imagine being free, having more autonomy and more ability to kind of make their own um, choices and, and have kind of freedom to build their own communities. So um, these practices have a really long history. And I think one of the things I like about the conversation we're having today is the emphasis on collective shared experience that it's not just, um, it's never been just a question of people trying to kind of make their own way as individuals or even as members of um, small families, but you know, people sharing experiences, coming together um, to, to, to worship, to express hope, to express um, you know, aspirations, you know, in a New Year's Eve situation, aspirations for the coming year. Um, and so I love the emphasis um, that this, that our discussion is placing on the collectivity and the ways that people have come together to kind of figure out what um, what freedom should mean and 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 kind of how to make lives together. Yeah, I, I think that's that's profound. Um, and and I and you know I think that collectivity and that freedom that that need and that ability to seek freedom and to to push for it collectively was something that took place, you know, well after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, well after the 13th Amendment was signed. There was a need to realize full freedom um, regardless of the ending of slavery. And Kendra, you know, I, I wonder if you might speak a little bit to that in terms of, I guess, the history, but also your perspective as a, as a museum educator and the way in which what it what your perspective professionally brings to this question about the history but also retaining the memory of of that history yes excellent um i have really started to think about this 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 topic and theme that we're that we're discussing and i like uh, kate how you were just uh talking about, you know, what's being surfaced right in our conversation is this collective nature. And I th really think that museums, one of the most amazing things that museums can do, and museum education, of course, can do is really provide for the contemporary audience. It reminds us of our connections. It, it can really help to jog the memory of individuals as they're engaging with our museum exhibitions, with our content, whether it be in physically or digitally, and as well as it, jogging the memories of individuals, it jogs the memory of our collective society. When we're putting forth exhibitions, or bringing forth themes, or talking about different events or time. I also think that museums um, can serve as a place where our memory of an event is also challenged, um, and challenged to be expanded in many ways. Um, again, whether it's physical or physically or in, in a space or through something digitally, we have to engage with the memories that others hold as well as the knowledge that others hold around a particular event or place or time. And then when I start to think about the education piece and that um, 
you know, to kind of connect back to what you were asking me earlier, Paul, about, you know, my learning later on in life about Watch Night and how that connected and deepened my understanding of what I personally experienced as a, as a young child. Um, you know, with education, it really allows us to incorporate other ways of knowing into our fuller understanding about whether it be historical individuals, whether it be themes, whether it be events in history. I think the museum education, we really look to bring primary and secondary sources to the forefront so that people are able to learn a bit more and really experience the evidence of history, what history is telling us and what history shows us. And it helps to connect us with our learning, right? So we can use objects and we can use documents and images to really stimulate conversations, which again, help to surface memories, but then through intentional study of sources, we get to understand our memories with deeper connection. I think, um, I think of some of the times that I really have had an opportunity to learn from people in my family. It may be because we're happened to watch a documentary together and there's something that jogs their memory about something that they experienced. I have uh, had an opportunity most recently to hear from my dad. We were watching something on PBS and he was like, oh yeah, well, when I was on the Freedom Ride and it was like, wait, what? <laughs> you, were, you were on one of the Freedom Rides? You know, and it was a, a great moment to then surface his memory. But then I tied it with my um, intentional study of history where I had that bigger context of historical, that bigger context of historical knowledge to then connect with his memory of what he experienced as being a part of a freedom ride that left from that very same church that I talked about earlier. Um, and that's been really important. I think of the various times that I've attended and gone to museums with my parents, with other family members, and there's something that they saw in an exhibition case that was like, oh yeah, we used to do that. Or, or yeah, I remember my mom telling me about this and I then got a generation's worth of history that Otherwise, I may not have ever uncovered or heard that story. So I really see museums as being a place that can really foster those individual, multi-generational connections, but then collectively, as we are all experiencing a story in, an, in a museum exhibition, again, whether it be physically or digitally, as we're all experiencing that and having our connections and our own personal meaning making in those spaces, we collectively as a society are being changed. And I think that's one of the beautiful things that museums can do to help foster not only uh, resurfacing and continuing to pull forward those memories, but then also bringing that historical evidence to really further enrich the stories. Yes. Lifting as we climb, they say. <laughs> Melisande, I want you to bring us home. Help us think about this from the perspective of what art and maybe art and beauty activism can bring to this memory making process to make it feel real and matter to us, not to, to bring history along into the present. Thank you, Paul, uh, to bring history along into the present. In the present, today, we are facing the very same issues in our lives as Americans that enslaved people faced um, 150 years ago. Who, what is freedom? And who gets to be free? Who are the decision makers about freedom? My DNA carries 11 generations of America. And in my DNA, in all of our DNA, if you have been here past three or four generations, is the building block upon which persons not ourselves have made decisions about who gets to free, gets to be free in America and who does not, who gets to vote and who doesn't. We've been working on this for 245 years. 
and we have silenced the voices of the oppressed and the disenfranchised to build up the voices of the franchised. On the other side of disenfranchisement, there is disenfranchisement. If you have been enfranchised, your fight for freedom, your idea of freedom is to keep what you have and make sure nobody else gets it. If you have been disenfranchised, your questions are, what about us? What about me? And why in this place can I not have all of the citizenship that is laid out for everyone? Why must the struggles be on the surface of the color of our skin and not who we are as living people? I've thought so much about this over the last couple of weeks since we started talking about it. And in my life, the time period, I was born in the middle of the last century, where a huge push for civil rights was going on one more time in America. And there were strides and achievements and accomplishment made. By 1968, that was over. I was 14 years old. And for the last 50 years of my life, I've been trying to figure out, as we all have, yet again, who gets to be and enjoy what it means to be an American. The people who sat together on watch nights from slavery through my childhood were sitting together in safety and community because the forces beyond us were setting about to destroy. People ran to their choices, to their churches, their places of worship. Can you imagine what watch night was during the Jim Crow years? And then we got to integration. And we have integrated so much that our community and our community have been brought into the burning house. I don't know what's going to happen, but yeah. we need to figure it out. That's that's deep and and so so important. And thank you for that. I've just taken a moment to to take all of that in and to take everything in from this conversation and i i think what what is one of the huge takeaways is how important it is for us to remember and to reclaim this history not just as moments in the past but as a wellspring for us in our present to and to be vigilant stewards of that history, but with an eye also on being vigilant about our present and being thinking about the need to continue to seize freedom. As Kate, as you so wisely pointed out, not just individually, but collectively for all of us. 
And so, you know, for that, I want to thank you all for this conversation, Kate Hollis, Melisande, and Kendra. And I want to leave you with the floor to send us out, to tell us what you think is important for us to remember about this history or why you think it's important for us to continue to reclaim this history in our present moment. What lessons does it have for us? Kate? I just want to go back to reclaiming or claiming the idea and the importance of being together with other people, especially now and when so many things have divided us from the people that we love, the pandemic, um, distance, you know, fear, death, um, that even if we can't physically be with people, um, which in my experience is so much better than being together on Zoom, but even if we can't you know, physically be in the same place that we are trying to take care of ourselves and one another by reinforcing those um, social bonds that really make, make us human and, and make us healthy. Um, but to, you know, put, to just add the kind of more, more edgy spin that Melisan just gave it to, that this is not only about, you know, it is partly, I think, about reinforcing the importance of human connection, but it's also about thinking about what our values are. And, uh, you know, that question, what about me? What about us? What about the people who, who aren't in power? What about the people whose rights, whose choices are being taken away right now? You know, who are we looking out for? What are we doing to, um, to, to further um, the, the needs and the, and the goals of people whose, whose lives are really in jeopardy right now? So I, um, I was really moved by what you said and, and want to just echo, you know, the, the importance of not taking all of the, of, of keeping some of the, um, the, the politics and the, the kind of real edge and what's at stake here, really, when we talk about um, the, the history of slavery itself and, and structures of racism in this country and the continuing need to grapple with them. So thank you. Yeah. Toni Morrison, the function of freedom is to free someone else. Hmm. Hollis? I think on so many <laughs> on so many levels um, through genealogy and and although I specialize in African American genealogy research, I also spent a number of years with the Daughters of the American Revolution, tracing helping individuals to trace their lineage back to the founding of this nation, and I think it's important for us to remember the lessons uh, that we that were displayed for us uh, with our ancestors from the very beginning is that we all need to be working together. The freedoms that we have gained are freedoms that we have to continue to work on and to strengthen um, to ensure that everyone has that freedom and can exercise it. Um, one thing that I look at with this nation um, is that we're still working on it. We're still perfecting democracy. With the Emancipation Proclamation, we were dealing with the uh, failures of our nation to extend freedom to all who were here. Uh, with the 13th Amendment, it's very significant in that it prevented any other group from being enslaved in this country. It ensured that those who were coming in here were given the rights they had birthright, citizenship rights, that's very significant. It wasn't only about African Americans, it's about anyone coming on this soil from this point forward. That's a major accomplishment for any nation. And I think it's important for us to remember this, that the examples that we have with history, with the period of enslavement, um, there are parallels throughout the world of people who lived with freedom and who were denied freedom. And this nation serves as a beacon for freedom to different people for different reasons. And I think that as we look at the period of enslavement, as we look at Watch Night, we look at Watch Night 
across time and, and across the world to see parallels that we can draw from to help us move forward, to help perfect the lives that we're living now and pave the way for future generations. Um, another thing that's important is that we help to document these experiences that we have. All too often, we live our lives and, and we just think about the past or we think about the present and we don't stop to document what we're doing today um, in any, in any uh, realm of our lives. That's important so that future generations can look back at this juncture when let's say a lot of things were at stake, freedom was at stake again, um, or it, it was, being compromised. What did the people of that generation do to address the issues at that time? So I think it's important for us to document and preserve the moment that we're living in and make sure that we not only document it, but we pass it on to the next generation or leave it in such a way that it can be discovered later on. Thank you. Yes, Kendra. <laughs> I was really moved by Melly's comment about uh, that we're facing similar questions um, that were that were faced in the post emancipation period of what is freedom, who gets to be free. I think a lot about, you know, just the very fact that in this country's history, the securing of freedom, both capital F freedom and the smaller lowercase f freedoms has been something that has been ongoing and cyclical and continues to, to need to be uh, safeguarded, uh, to use the phrase that you used earlier, Paul. I think about that and that's what really resonates for me is why it's important to remember and reclaim this history. It's the need to be able to see this as a trajectory. It's the need for us to be able to tell the upcoming generations who you know, will need to continue the fight to safeguard the freedoms that people have worked so hard to win and to uh, protect and expand and make sure is inclusive of everyone uh, and to continue to include people within this banner and umbrella of freedom. I also, um, you know, in thinking about our theme of family that we have been talking about uh, within the concept of watch night and it being something that families do together and uh, the importance of family in the African-American community, really thinking about that connection of family as being another way in which we form our identities um, and various types of identities are formed within our, our, our universe of our families. And when we are reclaiming and remembering and celebrating our families, those that are biologically given as well as those that are made through experience, right? It's for us as a form and was then as well a form of freedom making as individuals and as a collective. And I think the importance of family as we see it in the African-American community and other communities as well is one of those daily habits that we have that we might not look at and think of um, with the depth uh, that I think that they that it can hold for us when we see it as an element of that freedom making and reclaiming and thinking about this history just really gives a depth to what it means to keep those family connections and to continue those for the legacy of those to come. Chandra, thank you. We're all, I'm feeling all family here in this conversation. <laughs> Melisande, you've spoken so eloquently um, already on this topic, but last word. Thank you, Paul. Um, I've been reading snippets of the Federalist Papers. And in 1786, when they first gathered in Philadelphia and Alexander Hamilton spoke, um, one of the things that he said was that he feared that since the war happened, that there had been an excess of democracy in America. And the, the convention and the founding fathers went on to craft the constitution and eventually the Bill of Rights. An excess of freedom. The constitution in and of itself is a very flawed document. 
it set out specific rights for specific people in a specific manner. Every amendment to the Constitution has been to add rights for other people, therefore making the Constitution a great and inclusive document. The 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment were for all people. There has not been legislative or political action in this country to specifically benefit black people or descendants of enslaved people ever. I think that's worth remembering. We are Americans and have rights of Amer as Americans not exclusive to being black. Thank you so much. Thank you to you all. Um, this has been an incredible conversation. I think I'd be willing to keep on going, but I want you all to have a wondrous watch night to you and your families. And to our broader museum family, happy watch night. Stay safe, stay well. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. <laughs>